our agency who said, you know, you guys should really talk about this. We finally took the risk to launch a campaign that was called The Big Picture, talking about the future of snow sports with our sustainability efforts. Looking back, that was really cutting edge at the time. We thought we would get full blowback, but we decided that it was an important enough issue that we had to talk about it publicly and influence our customers and our followers on this issue. Welcome to the Backcountry Marketing Podcast. Today, I'm sitting down with Anik Shampoo. She is the Programs and Marketing Director over at Protect Our Winters Canada. Anik, good morning. Good to see you. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, where do we find you in the world today? Well, uh, today I live in Whistler, British Columbia. Um, yeah, kind of five minutes away from the, from the mountain. Um, but I am originally from saint agathe de mont Quebec. So French Canadian. <laughs> so just to geek out on Whistler a little bit, I, in preparation for this episode, I was watching um, Whistler's 50 years and counting documentary um, film. Yes, yes. When I've been up to Whistler, I've loved the the history photos of the, of the actual resort being built. But being able to watch that film was, I haven't watched all of it yet. I'm actually saving some of it for tonight, but it's amazing. It's such a great story. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that was a huge project for my team back in the day. Um, poured our heart and soul into it, um, created by our filmmaker extraordinaire, Mike Douglas, who's at Switchback Entertainment and, uh, our agency at the time, Origin Design, and it's a huge project, but, uh, very, very fun to work on. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. A lot of good photo archives to dig into and, uh, and get to look at and, and laugh at and reflect on, I'm sure. Yeah. The concept was built on, um, the climbing fell Valley uprising. So it was kind of, you know, built in that way. Um, so yeah, that's that's where the idea came from. Well, we're going to talk about your your role at Whistler here in a little bit, but to kind of set the stage for everyone, Anik, you've been in the snow world for quite some time, and you've got a lot of experience in it. and And I'm excited to have you on the show because we're going to be talking all about marketing and the intricacies and some of the nuance of marketing in the snow world. Like I said, you've been at Whistler. You were at Whistler for a number of years and talk about an amazing case study of and some amazing work that came out of that place. And so I'm excited to dig into some of that and share some of the things that you've learned. But let's talk a little bit first about your role at POW, what your role is and kind of what your day-to-day -day looks like. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for having me. I'm such a fan of this podcast. <laughs> I listen to many of the episodes and uh, know some of the guests you've had on. So I'm uh, I'm honored to be a part of it. I, I hope I can do justice with some of my background. <laughs> um, but yeah, I uh, were, worked at Whistler Blackcomb for over a decade. And now I find myself at Protect Our Winters Canada, which is the Canadian uh, organization of Protect Our Winters. I'm the programs and marketing director. And so we're a small team. So I have my hands in all kinds of stuff <laughs> from our programming, our education programs, our athletes, the marketing. Um, yeah. And it's this incredible small team, but we, we do lots. <laughs> How many chapters of POW are around the country or not the countries, the, the, the world, excuse me? Oh, uh, I don't know the exact number. We've got POW Australia, there's POW Europe that has POW Austria, POW Switzerland, POW US is the main um, organization where POW was founded. There's POWs in Norway. Um, yeah, did I say POW New Zealand? We're, we're expanding all over the place. POW Japan is now um, created. So lots of POWs um, in the world right now and growing. <laughs> Yeah, and, and how do, I've always been curious, how do all those different chapters work together? Is there much collaboration amongst each other or are you all kind of operating in your own silos? Well, it's it's interesting. It, it Definitely probably more in our own silos. They're all separate organizations and we all share the brand um, because we have now expanded to work on government policy. And so each individual country obviously has their own legislations and climate policies. So that's why we are separate. That being said, it's a super collaborative organization. We have meetings, we call each other, we share the branding, best practices, all that good stuff. So it's a really nice model where we have a lot of independence, 
But then we have the opportunity to work with others because there's really no one like us. <laughs> so we can share, you know, the idea is to share be best practices. In certain instances, we share um, corporate sponsors, things like that. I see. And when you say there's no one else like us, meaning there's no program like yours in existence? Well, we're a really unique uh, climate organization. Um, you know, we, we stem from the outdoor industry. And so we work um, in the outdoor world and use a lot of like marketing practices that come from the outdoor industry, but then we're a climate organization. So we're just kind of this unique model. Gotcha. Very in, cool. In the middle. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And day to day, you mentioned that you kind of oversee programs and, and marketing efforts. If you had to kind of paint a picture as to what you what you're up to daily, can you kind of give us an idea? Yeah, I guess to keep ourselves focused, we kind of work in threes. You know, one of our mandates is kind of to inspire the outdoor industry to take climate action. So that's where all the fun campaigns, we have a really fun one going on right now, um, come in. So we'll work on sort of that awareness. And then education is a huge part of what we do. So we'll work with other climate organizations to kind of translate and articulate some of the projects and legislations that they're working on. And then um, newly for POW Canada, we're really getting into that advocacy work, like physically going to government, to parliament in Canada and uh, working on uh, policies. So yeah. that's so it's sort of those three things that we try to balance. Um, so yeah, it's it's a busy time. <laughs> I can but imagine. That's kind of what my days look like managing those three things. <laughs> <laughs> when you were at Whistler, could you ever have imagined that you would be at POW now? You know what? No. And then in looking back, it all makes sense um, how I ended up at POW. Um, as much as I ended up in marketing. Um, you know, when I was studying at university, I kind of did this hybrid of like a strategic management program, but then sustainable development at the same time. It was BCom, but with lots of art classes. And even when I was working at Whistler Blackcomb, it was always super important to me that our campaigns or whatever we were working on had like a bigger purpose, a bigger message, a bigger message. I felt really compelled that we had such a strong brand and influence that we should use it for good. So much so that I do recall at one point my VP saying, you should, do you want to work for a nonprofit? <laughs> and so it kind of makes sense that my journey ended up at, uh, at POW. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, let's wind the clock back a little bit and, <laughs> and look at your time at Whistler. And I guess to kind of kick us off, is there anything unique about Whistler or the the ski and snow industry where the rules of marketing are broken or where you have to take a different approach because of the nuance of the snow world. Have, have you noticed anything like that over your years in the industry? A hundred percent. I think my time um, at Whistler Blackcomb, sort of the era that I was in, um, one of our coworkers described it as the glory days. And he said like, you don't know you're in the glory days until you're out of the glory days. And I really feel that now that, you know, that time has passed. I sort of, by luck, fluke, ended up working there in a really innovative decade of, of growth. And I think it came from exactly what you were talking about, breaking rules, pushing boundaries, doing things differently. Um, it felt like our mission and mandate was all about that during that era. Um, yeah. So, you know, things like I think are, you know, often, you know, marketing teams, they'll have sort of like this strategic imperative to like grow revenue or grow visits. Ours was truly at that time to define mountain culture, which is such a different way of thinking about um, marketing and what we were doing. It had like a real mission and purpose around that. Um, above, you know, increasing skier visits or those sort of increasing revenue, those typical kind of marketing objectives, they were there for sure in the background, but they weren't the primary focus. It was, I mean, I remember our um, VP of marketing at every meeting saying, scare me, do something different. <laughs> and and we thrived as a team um, hey. on that. <laughs> Man, talk about 
Talk about creative <laughs> freedom. That sounds like an amazing time to be there. Why was that the goal? You said our goal was to define mountain culture. Um, yeah. Where did that come from and why was that the focus? I think it, it really came from the passion of the people that work there. Everyone was truly a diehard mountain skier, snowboarder, mountain biker person. I, I, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I, I think it really came from that heart. Um, and then super savvy business people that I think they understood that if you created that culture, people would come. Um, maybe a faith in that because you couldn't initially prove it. <laughs> um, but it, yeah, that's, I think the only way that I can explain it was just this belief in that type of approach. Hmm. So I was at Alta a few years ago skiing and just, I don't know, like a couple months ago, I was flipping through a Mountain Gazette magazine and, and there was an ad in there for Alta and it had this tagline that said, digging out since 1938. And it was this epic photo of <laughs> Alta just buried in snow. And it got me thinking about what sells in the, the, the snow world, the ski world. And you're talking about this idea of build it and they will come defining mountain culture. What works? What draws people to a place like Whistler or Alta? And how do you reflect that in your messaging and in some of the campaigns that you guys created? Yeah, I think in our era or the era that I was in, it was all, like I said, it was about defining mountain culture, but doing it authentically, right? Um, I mean, Whistler Blackholm is this mecca for skiing and snowboarding. That infrastructure is there, the, that mount, you know, the mountain exists. But um, it was really important to the team at that time to foster that culture and attract the best of the best. And the idea was that if you do that, you know, that influence, that, you know, um, the way people feel inspired, it was really creating, even if you weren't a professional skier or a snowboarder, that aspiration to be part of it is what we fueled. And so we did it in so many different ways from hosting, you know, all female big mountain competitions. Um, one, t one year when it was sort of in the, my beginnings, um, our agency was really pushing us to be authentic about that. And we actually hired filmmakers, a bunch of local filmmaker crews, um, to tell the Whistler Black Home story, but with full creative, like we did not, I mean, we barely briefed them. We said, you tell us what you think it is. And we gave them creative carte blanche and, and let them go without us being involved so that it would truly come from them and their endorsement. So lots of kind of tactics like that to really prove the authenticity. Um, really take those risks. It, it was risky and we, we got some interesting things back and then we thought, oh, maybe we need a little bit of a brief. But it um, it was really all about, you know, we knew we had that authentic mountain culture and, it, and, 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 and we wanted to prove it. <laughs> was part of the reason for creating and fostering that authentic culture because Whistler is such a, a large corporate establishment that it was important to to hit that core of like we we understand our core audience 100 percent, 100 percent. we really you know it was like i said a genuine organization of genuine truly passionate skiers and snowboarders and ultimately i know in everybody's hearts it was to share that experience and that purpose and it was uh, uh it was genuine I mean, there's a business model behind it, of course. You know, it, it had to work, but um, it 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 was true. <laughs> Do you feel like today uh, across the country, ski resorts are losing? Are, are there some that are excelling and some that are kind of losing that that authenticity? Do you see that happening? You yeah, you you do in in the feel of the brand sometimes, and I think it comes from you know maybe at times. I mean, this is a big philosophical conversation, but, you know, this growth model and always having to increase and grow and add skier visits and add revenue. And I think some can get caught up in that at the forefront of their strategy and and you feel it. Um, I think it's, it's risky 
to not have that as your main strategy because ultimately, you know, shareholders expect you to grow and expect you to increase revenue. But I think if that's what leads your strategy, then you start to feel it in the authenticity. Um, and, you know, every aspect of your marketing starts to have that feeling. And I think, I don't know for sure, potentially longer term, um, that can sort of erode your brand. And Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you mentioned that your VP in every meeting would say, show me something that scares me. Uh, what was something that your team worked on that you felt like was was the scariest idea you could come up with? Oh, goodness. Um, there was so many from like building gigantic jumps in the Alpine and having our athletes hit them. I mean, there was so much risk in that liability wise. And <laughs> um, I guess the final big risk is that we decided to make uh a ski movie you know we're a marketing team we don't have budget to make full-blown ski movies but we thought you know we have the terrain we have the athletes we have and so we took this huge financial risk to make this ski movie um you know that was literally not selling the resort it was just proving that our resort is so big and rad and has the terrain that we have the resources to make a ski movie so things like that um, so huge budget risks, huge liability risks, uh, huge brand integrity risks. Like I said, we would, you know, hire filmmakers and let them tell us what they think of the mountain and push us. Um, and I think another risk that leads me a little bit to the world that I'm living in today was when we decided to go public with our sustainability efforts. So at the time, um, we decided to run a campaign about, you know, we had a, a decent, very good sustainability program at Whistler Blackcomb that had been going on for years. But the feeling was at the time that we weren't perfect. You know, we still had a large carbon footprint. There's people traveling to the resort. There's all these things. And so we kept, um, at the time it was, I think our, our agency origin who said, you know, you guys should really talk about this. And I remember the reluctance to do so because it was like, oh, we're going to get so much flack and people will say, oh, well, we're not doing this and we're not doing that. And so I believe it was in 2015 or 16 that we finally took the risk to launch a campaign that was called The Big Picture, talking about the future of snow sports, which, you know, looking back, that was really cutting edge at the time. And it was a huge risk. We thought we would get full blowback um, about not being perfect, but we decided that it was an important enough issue that we had to talk about it publicly and influence our customers and our followers um, on this issue because obviously we were seeing changes on our glacier and in our environment. So it doesn't sound like a big risk, but at the time, I think it really was. For our CEO to approve a campaign like that, to put ourselves out there, um, it was it was mega. Well, at the time, yeah, were there other ski resorts talking about climate and sustainability, or was this one of the first messages out there? I'm sure there were some. Um, I don't remember exactly, but I definitely think that going out in this big a way, we were probably, I don't want to say we were the first. There's probably a resort out there that's going to say, no, we were first. But um from the big resorts, I, I think we were we were at the beginning of it, that's for sure. I and think other was... resorts were working on it. It was more, you know, to go ahead and make that our main marketing campaign, that was pretty risky. And what was the outcome? You know what? As I say to other resorts who join our programming at Protector Winters, essentially nothing happened. <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't that bad. Um, I'm sure we got some comments on our social media here and there, but it certainly wasn't the blowback that we expected. If anything, people joined us and applauded us for working on it. Um, we got lots of media attention around it. Um, and, and it was okay. It was okay. It really was. <laughs> How did that campaign kind of open up your idea or your spectrum of how much we can talk about climate or how much of a role the resorts have in talking about climate? 
Yeah, I mean, I didn't know it at the time that I would end up working for Protect Our Winters Canada and oversee kind of this resort program of asking resorts to join us in the movement. Um, but, you know, this was the beginnings of my learning about resort sustainability and why it matters. And, um, and then more recently, kind of understanding the importance of policy change in the climate movement, you know, taking personal action or for resorts to do their own day-to-day -day actions is super important. And we say things like, it's not about changing light bulbs, it's about changing policies. What I've learned is the importance of ski resorts and other brands in the outdoor industry speaking out on the issue and putting themselves out there as a, this matters to us and the influence that this has on, you know, building legislation on our politicians. Um, so I, I think it gave me the confidence to say to others that, you know, it's okay to start somewhere, not be perfect and speak out and that that matters almost more. And that ultimately I don't, I, I think it will only impact your business in a positive way from what I've seen. So, yeah, let's talk a little bit about your time at POW now. If you had to describe the optimism about the future of of snow sports, uh, kind of a blanket statement, how how do things look from from your perspective um, in terms of in terms of snowpack levels and in terms of the direction that that things are going? Whoa, oh, that is such a difficult question to answer because it is so regionally is that a word dependent you know uh -huh. um in some cases in very cold climates it can mean more snow in other cases it could mean you know shorter seasons it it really depends where your base um generally our um team of scientists did some really compelling research that talks about kind of pathways like if we don't change um, the trajectory of our carbon emissions, what it could mean for snow sports in 50 years. And if we do make changes and you, you see some significant differences, but it really depends on, on where you're based, um, how you adapt to it, all sorts of factors. So it's a difficult question to answer. I mean, at the end of the day, it's worrisome um, for all sports, for all outdoor environments, things are changing. Um, they're accelerated. The changes are accelerated right now because of our impact. So, yeah, it's it's difficult to say, but um, we we certainly need to take it seriously. <laughs> and what is what does success look like for POW? If you you know, as you as you look at a day and you're like, was this a good day? Did we do a good <laughs> job? What does that mean? Yeah, I mean. The ultimate mandate of POW is sort of to represent the outdoor industry and climate action. So a good day, I think, is when we're taking action. And I think what we're understanding in time is um, we need clout. We need influence. So, you know, at POW Canada right now, we have 32,000 members. It's free at POW Canada to become a member. Um, and so 32,000 people standing behind us, as well as like the 40 outdoor brand partners that support us, the 10 ski resorts, we're starting to have clout and clout and influence. You know, like I said, it's all about changing our systems and policies. And so we need that clout and influence to push on our politicians. They will, they listen to the people. So what we need is more people. We need masks, you know, um, movements we need we need that cloud and so we need people to join and it it doesn't take much to join you know it, it starts really signing up with your email and that gives us a number to say you know if we could hit that 50,000 100,000 um we were talking recently that you know to really have an an impact or an influence kind of that 1% of the population goal is super important. They say a, a tipping point is at 10% of the population for movements. Um, so that's kind of our big goal right now is to gather everybody from the outdoor industry 
to support us, to come along with us so that we can then translate that influence um, at government level. And that's what POW US is doing and all the other POWs kind of across the world in their own regions. I hadn't heard that before. If you can, if you can get ten percent of the population behind you, that's when that's when change happens. Well, I I mean, don't don't hundred percent quote me, but I've read that that's like a tipping point. Okay, um, that's a huge, you know, and the the one percent I've heard is sort of like you're starting to get momentum. Sure. And what are some misconceptions that people might have about POW? Yeah. Um, well, I don't know if it's misconceptions. Um, we definitely get challenged in areas that where we're not perfect. So as an example, you know, part of our influence and we have this incredible group of volunteer athletes um, that stand behind us. Um, but then when they join POW, they become extremely scrutinized. Oh, I saw you get in a helicopter to do this ski film, or I saw you had a sled, or you drive a pickup truck, or, and, you know, at POW, we allow, and or the ski resorts as an example. Oh, but you're, you know, using energy to run your lifts. And I, I mean, honestly, you could say that about anyone, right? To have that sort of perfectionist mindset, um, and, you know, like if I could use our athletes as an example, our athletes will always take the best pathway, if it, the best sustainable pathway, if it's available to them, you know. Um, but, you know, the way our systems are built and our society is built, the way we use energy, we're not quite there yet. You know, electric sleds are coming, but they're not at the level that our athletes need them. The minute they are, I know they will switch to them. And so... Our approach is truly that progress. We say it, we say it over and over and over. Progress, not perfection. And I think it's, you know, where POW really shines is that we allow people that are not perfect to join the movement. Because at the end of the day, like I said, we need more people that care. And if we block every person that did something imperfect towards the environment and and on honestly the the ones who are who are causing harm to the environment um fossil fuel industry they want to shame us into not taking action if we're not perfect and so we're kind of fighting against that saying you know um there's a saying we must act with dirty hands you know if we block every person that's not perfect from the movement it limits us so much now obviously we hold you know, our resorts and our brand partners and our athletes accountable, you know, in realistic situations where they can make a better choice, of course. And we want everyone to progress on their journey. We certainly don't want to greenwash or anything like that. But that concept of progress, not perfection is something that we're sometimes criticized, but that we're okay with, if that makes sense. Yeah, that seems like such a crippling mindset to be had. Like, that's almost like saying, you know, that's like not that's like choosing not to go on a run because you're out of shape. You're like, well, I'm out of shape, so I might as well not run. Completely, completely. And so many people are hesitant. Um, even myself, you know, when I first, you know, wanted to work for POW, I wondered if I was enough of a climate activist to join the organization, you know, had a minor in sustainable development. But, you know, in my day to day, I was felt pretty <laughs> environmentalist but I was like I'm not a PhD I don't know I'm not perfect should I join and so um yeah that reluctance to be part of the movement I think is a is a real thing and that's what we're combating you know we want people just start just start even resorts who are like we want to join POW but we haven't really do you know we're so small especially smaller resorts you know we don't have the budget to have like a sustainability manager and we don't know if we should join. And I say, of course you should join by adding your voice. That is such an important step at the beginning, you know, and then you learn and you educate yourself and then your journey begins. And so it's really meeting people where they're at um, and kind of fighting that reluctance to to step up. Yeah. So so you're on this mission to to capture 
one percent of the population and then in the future 10 percent of the population for your movement and as you mentioned earlier pow kind of has three goals inspire educate and then and then the policy component and this is kind of where your role your marketing role i find is really interesting because pow like as you mentioned you guys are very unique you take a lot of marketing initiatives and efforts to help accomplish these goals so kind of tie this back into your role as a marketer and how, how do you go about this? How do you go about spreading this mission and, and, and finding support and finding members through some of your campaign work that you've done? Yeah, I think our, our model and our approach, you know, is to really use essentially a lot of us came from the outdoor industry, our marketers from the outdoor industry, filmmakers, um, you know, uh, and so, We've, you know, my work at Whistler Blackcomb, we were at the time talking about building movements for the snow sports industry. And we became quite good at, you know, finding that like secret sauce of how you influence. And for me, POW made total sense. It's like using those best practices for this greater mission. Um, and so we really try to use the learnings that we learned, you know, from marketing in the outdoor industry and bringing that unique approach to the climate movement. So working with influencers like our athletes, um, building these really irreverent campaigns that are eye catching, tapping into people's passion for the sport, you know, finding that common ground. Cause I think, you know, in the climate movement, if you can find sort of this common pa passion, then you can start to have a conversation because you have common ground and sort of that trust of having that the, those shared passions. So yeah. we really build on our campaigns um, in thinking about those things. And I think the other thing that makes us unique is the outdoor industry is pretty fun. You know, it's all these kind of fun, pe purpose, passionate people and as much as the climate movement is a tough topic, sometimes I think that can be exhausting and turn people away. So we really try to, if we can, in sort of a re responsible, educated way, bring that fun and irreverence to our campaigns. Uh, we have a pretty fun one going on right now that I think is really pulling at people's heartstrings and giving them a smile and then they can feel like, hey, I can be part of this movement. It's not all dire and depressing. <laughs> What's an example of a campaign that you guys have put together that like shook your expectations? You're like, oh my gosh, like this has so much potential. Because it, it sounds like what you're saying is you're taking, you're taking what you've learned at Whistle. You've taken these modern, very creative approaches uh, that are traditionally used in a product or the resort world. And now you're applying them to the nonprofit advocacy world, which is maybe, that sounds like something that's perhaps unique about POW. It sounds like it is unique. What's what's an example of, of a campaign or something that you guys implemented that then had a tremendous response? Yeah. Oh, I mean, this is somewhere before my time, some are during my time. I think any campaign that we've done with our athletes that kind of utilize sort of that outdoor language feel speak that really brought sort of issues in the climate movement back to sort of that passionate outdoor person um there's so many examples also um one super successful one um we called it the fact back campaign go fact yourself <laughs> and so we, you know, through our athletes and with our scientists, so we kind of address these kind of like misconceptions um, in the climate movement. At the time, there was an election going on. So it was sort of taking words out of the politician's mouths and then back backing things like that. We did one um, that was called Send It, um, Justin Trudeau, and playing on the fact that our prime minister was a snowboarder and we wanted him to... Um, work on a certain legislation. We have a, a super fun one right now going on that I have to give full credit to Max Young, our, our brand manager. And it's kind of playing on the fact that right now, sort of that nostalgia 
of the 80s and 90s were doing this super cheesy campaign about glaciers looking for love <laughs> and uh, hot glaciers looking for love. <laughs> and <laughs> we did this really retro video of, you know, those call-in phone types of, um, you know, wanting to find a match. Um, so playing on those kind of really cultural things and then bringing it back to kind of the outdoor industry or whatever's going on, sort of marketing trends that are happening. So yeah, really using kind of those, that fun, irreverent language that people aren't really expecting when it comes to the climate movement. Why is it you think that generally other advocacy groups out there maybe don't rely on some of this creative storytelling or these these creative ideas to help move their mission forwards? Yeah, I'm not sure. And, and honestly, I think that's changing. We're seeing, um, I think maybe we were some of the first, but we're seeing a lot of them kind of following suit. Um, I think at times, maybe it's because it is such a serious topic and kind of that feeling of needing to be so perfect and accurate in speaking about it and a accuracy and science is hugely important. The facts need to be correct. And so that at times that makes it a little more challenging to be fun and playful because you don't want to get it wrong. And that's something that, you know, we are super lucky. We have what we call our science alliance. So a group, we're almost at 20 scientists now that are all volunteers, but back us. And so we run everything by them and make sure that, you know, what we're speaking about is accurate. But that takes a lot of effort to do the creativity and the science um, is, you know, the most challenging thing I've ever been part of. Absolutely. Well, yeah, not only are you speaking to your, your core, you have to be authentic to them, but now the stakes are much higher. Like, I mean, sure, getting someone to go and ski for a day, like that's that's fun. But what you're working on now is much more important, arguably. Yeah, I mean, imp important for sure. Everything's, you know, every every role, every job, you can find purpose in it too, you know. we. I remember we took our role when I was at Whistler Black Home super seriously. You know, we were, you know, this is somebody's hard-earned vacation. We wanted to make sure that they had a good time, but definitely the climate movement right now feels very, very, very important to me anyways. So something that I've I've wondered about, maybe your 1% example is the answer to this question, but in the US, 3% of the population skis. And that's such a small, tiny number of, of the entire, you know, the entire country. I guess my question is like, do skiers and snowboarders truly have the potential to make an impact if there's only 3% of us that that are out there? 100%. Um, and that's back to my my 1%. 3% to me is huge. If we could get all those people <laughs> um, in the United States, especially Canada is a much smaller country, but, um, and then globally, right? If POW could convince the entire outdoor industry to join our movement, the power we would have, pun intended, but... Um, <laughs> It would be insane. So, hey. and then the thing with the outdoor industry or the ski industry is I really feel there's so much potential there because we say we're really the canaries in the coal mine. Like we are on the front lines. Like when you're out in the outdoors or skiing, or I mean, it's it's really why Jeremy Jones and Mike Douglas on the Canadian side as uh, snowboarders and skiers being out there every day, they could see the changes, you know? People that live on islands, have been seeing the changes for decades. Um, outdoor enthusiasts, you can't be outside participating in these sports and not see the impact, right? And so, and and also the, the passion for the outdoor environment. Um, I think there's a real connection there. And so it could be, it is such an important group to highlight this issue. Hey. And at times I think, oh, it's a little, you know, oh, you outdoor people, you know, worrying about your sports, you know, there's much bigger problems in the world. And that's for sure true. But, you know, it's proven over and over again that, you know, some of the initiatives and the solutions in the climate movement can have 
such a good positive impact on other social issues. So that makes me happy as well, that it's not just, you know, our sports, it's beyond that. Yeah. So, so kind of continue on that, on that note, as you look towards the future of skiing and snowboarding, is there a growing population of people that are embracing these sports or is it declining or is it, is it, is it staying even? Um, I don't know the statistics myself. You certainly saw during COVID a huge uptake um, in outdoor recreation. I think mental health and all those things really propelled people to get outside, um, which is good and bad. Some of the, some things we noticed, um, newcomers to recreating outdoors sometimes leave a bigger impact or footprint. So we're talking about how do we educate you know, new people going out into these environments. Ultimately, I think it's super positive to get everyone to get outside. But, um, you know, it's an opportunity to really educate people on, you know, the concept of leaving no trace, you know, how you recreate into these environments. And I know our athletes are huge influencers in that area, um, sharing their knowledge. So, yeah, it, it, I'm sure there's statistics. It feels like um, COVID really um, brought on um, this idea of, of the importance of getting outside and recreating. Yeah. Uh, with the work that POW does, when you're messaging people, when you're talking to people, are you talking to, I mean, I know you're talking to the core, but are you also, is there talk about trying to bring you know, new people, newcomers into the sport, into POW as well? And how do you differentiate your messaging between those two groups? Yeah, it's important because like I said, for us, it's all about bringing the masses. So we definitely need to move beyond our core. Um, you know, our name Protect Our Winters, I think leads some to believe we're a winter organization, but we truly want to represent the outdoor, the entire outdoor industry. So we want to make sure that we're speaking to all sports, all seasons. Um, so we're, we're definitely trying to branch out um, in that aspect, trying to find new people and all levels. I mean, inclusivity and diversity is super important to us. So it's something that we're actively working on um, to make sure that we're not this exclusive group. We've talked about a lot. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you're passionate about that you want to you want to share with us? Oh goodness, I feel like I've shared all my <laughs> my passion. I mean, yeah, I I think ultimately what what led me to POW is like as this diehard skier outdoor enthusiast, I really feel a responsibility to sort of give back to the environment. Um, that I recreate in. I think there's so much that we can learn um, from our Indigenous people and how they view the planet and the environment. I think there's a huge corporate responsibility there when you work in the outdoor industry to give back. Um, you know, models like Patagonia and, you know, other companies that we work with are really trying to figure out, you know, that balance of participating in the business of the outdoors, but also giving back and our planet needs it. So I'm hopeful that that others will follow suit and um, yeah, coming to POW Canada or POW in the US is a great place to start. <laughs> well, I appreciate you taking the time and you know, you started this conversation by saying, looking back, I understand how all the dots connect uh, as to how to where you ended up today. And it's been cool to kind of reflect on where you've been and, and some of the projects you've been a part of and the lessons you learned there and how you're applying them today. So I appreciate you taking the time to, to come on and, and share your ideas. Something that we've been doing to wrap up the show with each guest, what questions are you asking yourself? What keeps you up at night these days? What are you wondering? Oh, so many, so many. <laughs> I guess with um, some big questions that I ask myself is, yeah, how ultimately, how do you get more people to care? You know, everybody lives in their daily lives. And I think sometimes it's, there's so much going on in the world, especially right now, you know, 
there's two ways about it. You can kind of, sometimes it's just easier to tune out and just focus on your, on your own life and your own day to days. And so, yeah, how, how do we get people to care, especially I think people with means, you know, the, we talked about ski and snowboarding, you know, it's a, it's an expensive kind of sport. And so how do we get people who have the means to get involved and share in that sense? Um, yeah, I think that's my, my biggest question. (laughs) Yeah. What a great question. If folks are listening and they have any ideas and they want to share ideas with you on it, where can people go to find you? (laughs) Uh, they can definitely find us at protectourwinters.ca. That's protectourwinterscanada.ca for the Canadians, uh, protectourwinters.org for the Americans. And for anybody else listening in other countries, there's probably a POW near you. Um, yeah, you can find us on uh, all our social channels. We're super active. We have a really fun campaign going on right now. Just check it out. Um, that's a combo of all the good things I talked about, outdoor industry, climate, fun. <laughs> so yeah, that would be the best spot. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I'm sure... I know where I can find you in the next two months as the snow starts to fill up the slopes. I'm sure you're going to be out there having some fun. But Anik, thank you again for taking the time to share your ideas and to share your thoughts. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Oh, and thank you. I, I'm always reluctant to do these, but if I can speak about some of the stuff we're working on, I'm, I'm all for it. And I, I really appreciate the, the platform and the time. Thank you. Well, I hope you have a great rest of your day. And yeah, I'm going to think about this question. How do we make more people care? That's a that's a, a simple question, but man, is there a lot behind that? Absolutely. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye.